we've got Will Fleming with us, and I'm so pleased Will is here because he's joining us. He's finishing up at Cambridge literally right about now. Next week. <laughs> Next week, yeah. And is joining us here in Oxford as a, as, as, a, as a research fellow, and we're so pleased to have him. He's obviously working on something that's close to uh, a lot of our hearts, um, and I can't wait to hear um, his evaluation of individual level mental health interventions in the workplace. Well, over to you, and then uh, any clarifying questions, please go ahead. But as we typically do 20, 25 minutes presentation, and I'm leaving lots of time for uh, uh, Q&A with all of us on this topic. Well, over to you, thank you. Thanks, Jan. Um, thanks everybody for coming as well. Um, yeah, so today um, I'm going to be talking about my evaluation of individual level mental health interventions in British workplaces. Um, so this is one part of my PhD in Cambridge, which is in the Department of Sociology. Um, it's one chapter on workplace well-being initiatives uh, in UK workplaces. Um, that PhD is sort of a, a what, why, who, and what effects of workplace well-being in, um, in the UK. Uh, and so this, this chapter in particular is doing uh, outcome analysis of the interventions. Um, and yeah, as Jan mentioned, I'm going to be one of the research fellows at the Wellbeing Centre here in Oxford for the foreseeable. And so looking forward to developing uh, some of the work on workplace interventions. Okay, uh, so briefly today, just a quick outline. Um, I'll give a quick context, then very quickly review the existing empirical evidence in this area and some of the critiques. Um, no one wants too much literature review in a presentation, so that'll be quite quick. Uh, then going on to how I've done the study uh, is an observational study, um, and then we'll have results and there'll be an extensive discussion of the limitations considering it is an observational study. Um, so yeah, but we're talking, today I'm going to talk about individual level interventions. Uh, maybe your boss is taking on an ayahuasca retreat uh, in the name of team building, but um, probably more likely um, it might be a mindfulness class um, that you're being offered. Uh, for example, this is a, a brochure for the mindfulness initiative at Cambridge, um, and I, I've taken part in this one. I'm sure there's a similar thing at your universities as well. Um, so briefly, just to define a little bit more what I mean by individual level interventions, um, the idea is a strategy to target change in individuals' behavior and psychology and psychological processes, uh, really trying to improve workers' ability to manage themselves and uh, their well-being. Uh, they are increasingly popular. Um, the CIPD, which is the main HR body in the UK, they they reckon that over half of employers have um, a formal well-being strategy and within this, uh, well, no, so, and across all the organizations they survey, around 60% yeah, around of them have uh, training aimed at building resilience, uh, such as coping techniques, mindfulness. Uh, so these kind of individual programs. Uh, recent NICE guidelines, so sort of clinical advisors for the UK, uh, they, on, in their advice on mental well-being at work, you recommend all employers offer ongoing access to mindfulness, yoga, and meditation. Um, however, I argue from looking in the literature that there is not enough evidence of effectiveness of these individual strategies. Um, this is acknowledged by some of the sort of policy reports. So Stevenson Farmer, who did an independent review on mental health and work, they say there's pressing need for more evidence. Uh, Wellcome Trust, you know, who fund a lot of mental health and well-being research, they also think there's significant gaps. Um, but there are RCTs and systematic reviews. Um, within this, though, the quality varies a, a lot, and I suggest the underlying quality of this is low. Um, often very small sample sizes, you know, sometimes less than 25 across the whole study. There's a question of fidelity, you know, so how you know, that often if it's in an experimental setting, initiatives are being implemented well and in standardized ways, um, whereas we probably want to understand the settings that it's, you know, the fidelity is less high. Uh, there's also um, treatment selection bias in most of the experimental studies. Uh, so for example, um, there's a paper by Bostock and colleagues. <laughs> and the, um, so they did a study of headspace in uh, two British IT firms and you know, they find positive effects of these, of, um, yeah, Headspace is a digital mindfulness app, and they find positive benefits from this. But what they don't emphasize is that only 10% of people 
you know, respond to the emails advertising these programs, and then, then the randomization happens. So selection bias, treatment selection bias is a problem. Uh, there's also some pretty poor quality research which backs it, which backs up some of the sort of policy review documents, but I'm, I won't go into that too much. Uh, alongside my methodological and empirical concerns, there are also empirical normative and strategic critiques of these individual level programs. Um, you know, the argument is that they're ineffective, uh, primarily they're ineffective because they ignore the social context of work, uh, actual working conditions, you know, the sort of drivers of workplace well-being that are quite well established in uh, well-being literature and job quality literature um, and in health and safety literature as well. Uh, yeah, the argument is that these individual level strategies try to change the worker, not the workplace. Um, we could say that there are faulty diagnoses, um, so we're misidentifying the problem. There are bad prescriptions, so ineffective uh, programs or uh, ideas, um, and also there could be toxic side effects. So if you're trying to change people's mental well-being by implying it's about you know your own mental capacities, you know there's a the chance of sort of self-blame and uh, these kind of psychological harms. Uh, then more critically in sociology, so as I said, I'm, you know, I'm a sociologist, I do come from this background and, you know, part of my interest in this topic was, uh, is provoked by uh, critical accounts of workplace well-being. Um, so uh, some other concerns are that strategies might be a reputational alibi. So, you know, hold your hands up, oh, look, we've got a, we've got a stress management program, what are you, what are you complaining about? Um, they can instrumentalize well-being for productivity. And um, so, you know, you're only interested in making people happy at work to get them to work harder. And, you know, I think workers can see through that. Um, managerial control, this is a broad uh, critical argument that is uh, the latest technology within um, social, social technology within management apparatus. Uh, and also there's a sort of idea that it can, you know, they're seeking to construct an ideal worker. Often this happens along um, ableist, gendered, and racialized lines. Uh, so the, yeah, this, this is the, the provocation for the study really is um, existing evidence base and some of these critical accounts. Uh, so to set up the, the research that I'm presenting for you today, um, I use data from the Britain's Healthiest Workplace Survey, which is a repeated cross section and is a convenient sample. Um, it, the survey is really a competition uh, and this is why it's a convenient sample. So any British employers with over 20 employees can um, participate. Uh, it's at the surveys at two levels. So there are variables at the organization level, you know, just organizational characteristics and HR practices. And then also at the employee level. So yeah, extensive coverage of personal characteristics, um, perceptions of job, um, health, well-being, lifestyles, uh, these kind of topics. Um, yes, yeah, so this means that the data is uh, multi-leveled and clustered within these organizations. So I take the data from the 2018 wave for this analysis, so about almost 28,000 employees in 150 organizations. Uh, yeah, there's some sample selection bias, you know, so-called healthy firms, you know, they're the ones who want to be, want to win the prize of Britain's healthiest workplace, and also healthier workers, you know, it's just advertised via email, so those who are already engaged in health discourse probably more likely to apply. Uh, higher earners are represented and um, higher education levels are represented as well. Uh, is that everything on the data? Yeah, I think that is. Um, so talking about the actual interventions that I've been evaluating, um, they are, yeah, so these are all included in the, in the BHW data um, and the measure of participation is just a binary indicator of yes, I participated or in the last 12 months or no. Um, this is a big limitation of the analysis uh, because, you know, participation is going to vary. Sometimes it might be a one-hour class. Sometimes it might be a 10-week 10, program, weekly attendance, this kind of thing. So this is a problem, but, yeah, there'll be very, there's going to be um, variation there. Uh, but yeah, so we're looking at volunteering or charity work programs, uh, mindfulness, resilience, energy, and stress management, uh, well-being app, massage and relaxation, time management, natural well-being, uh, some interventions around sleep and coaching. Uh, in general, participation across all these programs is generally very low, um, which ties into some of the uh, treatment selection bias in experimental studies as well. Um, you know, you're only getting around, yeah, about not even 25% of quarter of workers actually engaging in any of these interventions. Uh, so how am I analyzing the data? Uh, so I'm sorry for the economists in the room, uh, is propensity score analysis. Um, and basically the idea is that you have observational data, um, 
often cross-sectional, and you essentially set up a sort of synthetic control trial. Uh, you estimate the probability of you know, participating, being in a treatment group or not, and then you match um, pairs. So you estimate that probability with various, uh, various relevant predictors of both your outcome and of your treatment. Um, and then you get a reduced sample, which is uh, matched pairs um, with the same probability of participation. In this case, I've used clustered matching. So you, so you get paired with somebody in your organization. Uh, the idea that you know, they would likely participate in the same initiative. Um, I take the two-step Bayesian approach to analyzing this, which is not really that Bayesian. Um, it's mainly just a uh, different specific time, type of regression estimation. Uh, in terms of outcomes, so once you get your reduced sample, then you, know, you can perform your outcome analysis as you would on an unmatched um, sample. Uh, I look at life satisfaction, short Warwick Edinburgh mental well-being scale, uh, Kessler scores of distress, uh, work engagement, I think the Utrecht work engagement score, and job satisfaction as well. Uh, there are sort of four problems with this uh, analytic approach. Uh, the first one is one that people are normally unhappy with, which is the unobservables. You know, we can only match on variables that we actually have information on. Um, then the, there's some argument in the literature that this can often present unbalanced post-matched samples. Uh, and yeah, I, that does seem to happen sometimes. Here, the, the balance was very good. You know, I checked, I checked following matching and across all of the key variables, they were, you know, it's almost identical. Um, so this wasn't a problem in this case. Uh, the main problem though is that it's still cross-sectional, so causal claims are severely limited. Um, and also there's a problem with reverse causality. Um, on the screen that we've got here, my little diagram is just is covered up slightly, um, but the idea is there are predictors of participation in our um, treatment, and this is how we get propensity scores, but then these are also linked with our outcomes. Uh, and then the idea is that we can infer a treatment effect by just looking at differences in our well-being scores. However, the reverse is also true, where our prior well-being is very likely to predict our participation in the treatment. Uh, and this can go both ways. Um, you know, if, we, if your stress have poor um, mental health and well-being, then you're, you know, you're likely to participate in programs trying to improve this. Or maybe you've been prescribed it by your HR team, your organization, or encouraged to take part. Um, also, the other way, you know, if you have high uh, well, mental well-being, maybe you practice good mental hygiene, you know, you're used to engaging with sort of personal individualized well-being discourses and practices, so you might be more likely to participate there. So this reverse causation is really the, the key problem in the analysis that I'm going to discuss, uh, I'll discuss quite a lot in the result. Okay, oh, and then this is just quickly, uh, before and after matching, this, the right-hand plot, you just see you get a more balanced sample with probability of participating in programs. Uh, look at some of the predictors just very quickly. Uh, this is this model, this model, and some others is part of another paper in my PhD, so not as interesting here. But yeah, women are more likely to participate in these mental health programs. The young, higher job level, uh, existing mental health problems. So that speaks to maybe tailored approaches in HR. Um, full time workers, regular working hours, so you know, 38, 40 hours. Um, office workers and positive perceptions of your employer and organization. Um, yeah, just quickly there. So the results, let me look through this. Overall, no. Um, which, yes. Uh, so yeah, so we can look from the top. If you participate in any of these programs, uh, it seems as though there's null effect between those who do not, those who participate and those who uh, do not participate. Um, the same can be said when we look at the individual programs, uh, mindfulness, relaxation, coaching, uh, well-being app, time management, um, you know, the model is estimated as, you know, there's no difference between those participating and those who don't. Uh, some of the whiskers are very wide on these. That's just, that's due to low sample size and in these interventions. So I won't spend too much time on them. Uh, the only, the notable differences are, oh, sorry, I should mention, this is for the short work Edinburgh mental well-being scores. I'll show the life satisfaction ones after this. Um, yeah, so the notable differences are resilience and stress management courses. Uh, we're getting a negative coefficient estimated, and for volunteering programs, we're seeing a positive relationship. Uh, it's similar for life satisfaction, you know, these resilience and stress management programs with negative estimates, uh, volunteering programs with positive, although a bit closer in there. Um, although mindfulness now, these initiatives are also being estimated for a negative effect. 
so on first impression, this is not very good, but you know, we can just take some regression coefficients and make some uh, causal inference for that. So I'll go into a little bit more. Uh, so the first thing is try and address that treatment selection bias uh, and try and get a bit more certainty in whether we're actually seeing any effects here is by looking at whether workers had prior stress levels. So they're asked whether in the last 12 months your health has suffered from work-related stress. Um, so no, they can answer no, yes, to some extent, yes, definitely. Uh, so in those interventions that have seen null effects, um, we're seeing that you know across these sort of three stress levels, obviously there's a difference, but within treatment control in those groups, there doesn't seem to be anything noticeable going on. Uh, the same is for the same can be said for these the resilience um, interventions, and same for volunteering as well. So once we break down to these stress levels, any notable differences sort of disappears. So lots of null effects for you. Uh, these. Plots I've shown you, um, I've also done sort of interaction terms to look at subgroup analysis for gender, ethnicity, and income, uh, because theoretically and uh, empirically, these are going to be of interest to well-being and management practices, um, but there doesn't seem to be any difference between the groups when we look at those effects. Um, so there's still problems with selection bias, but how can I work through this uh, to get you know, some sort of sense of, uh, yeah, some sort of sense of actually what's going on, whether there is a treatment effect or not. Uh, so first I'll take those um, interventions that had uh, resumators having null effects. Uh, so there are two options. Either there is no selection bias and there's just no effect. So those participate and those who don't, you know, there's just no difference. Or there is selection bias and there is a positive treatment effect. So this would imply that those participating had prior lower um, well-being scores, but through participation, they were able to get up to the same level as their colleagues who are not, not participating. Uh, this you know, shows some promise for these strategies, but would indicate they wouldn't be appropriate for universal adoption and universal encouragement for everybody to join in, but that there would be benefit for just those prior stress levels. Um, so those are the two options, um, both of which plausible. Uh, then, the, then if we look at think about resilience and stress management um, programs that were estimated as having this negative relationship, and there are three options. So, either it's just a negative effect, you know, they're causing harm, um, maybe because of yeah self blame, um, you know, misidentification of problems, you know, you're actually making people more uh, distressed and unhappy at work. Um, so that's one possibility. Uh, the second is that there's no effect and there's selection bias. So people who have lower levels of um, well-being, who are unhappier, are more likely to participate, but the programs aren't, you know, they're, they're not doing anything. And so that's why we're getting this negative effect. Uh, I, so theorize that this is probably the most, um, most likely. Or the third option is that there is a positive effect, but it's not enough. So if you're, you know, you're unhappier, you're more likely to participate, um, but they're actually you're getting a positive effect and it's, you know, perhaps boosting up, but you're not getting into the same level as your colleagues who weren't participating and who maybe had prior happier level, um, yeah, who uh, yeah, didn't participate. Um, this sort of speaks also to, in, you know, that these, this suggests that these interventions are also ineffective in the grand scheme of things. Um, they're not adequate. They're not an adequate response to the, the problems of unhappiness at work. Uh, the third for the volunteering programs, which had the positive coefficient estimated, uh, there are three options again. Uh, either we just have a positive effect, this is good for you, um, plausible, uh, or second option is that there is no effect and there is selection bias. So people who are happier are more likely to volunteer, they're more, you know, they're more active, they're more engaged, uh, so that's why I participate and that's why we're getting a positive estimate there. Um, or three, uh, there is a positive effect and there's selection bias. So those have people who are more likely to volunteer, but they're also, um, but you know, they're also more likely to be doing that anyway. So there's maybe a positive effect, but it's not as big as the estimates are suggesting. Um, all three of these suggest that volunteering opportunities should be advocated for all employees, because even if there's no effect, you know, there's the positive externality of doing civic goods and um, you know, engaging in communities, et cetera, outside of work. So even if it's not good for you, it's gonna provide some good um, externally. So the, yeah, so this is, how, this is how we can think through these effects while acknowledging the sphere of selection bias in observational studies. Um, so just to try and wrap up with some final comments. Um, yeah, so I argue there's 
there's a lack of existing evidence to support individual level strategies um, from, you know, from looking through the literature. Um, the findings I presented suggest that um, those who participate and those who don't, you know, they're no, they're no better off. Um, you know, that sort of suggests that um, how, um, you know, how certain we are of that is unclear. Uh, then third, yeah, there's no evidence found in support of a universal approach. So even if there are some positive benefits, um, it's less, um, yeah, we can, we can advocate universal adoption. Uh, there is some promise for volunteering programs. In terms of moving beyond, I guess the big question is, you know, do these research findings hold up? Obviously, you know, they're not going to give us the same causal um, inference that experimental studies offer. Um, can it act supplementary? You know, we've got a large data set with hundreds of organizations, tens of thousands of employees, different interventions in different organizations with varying participation and varying sort of intensity of interventions. So there is a variation there. Um, yeah, I guess that's almost to the audience to help determine, you know, how valid are these findings, if, if at all. Um, then, you know, obviously, longitudinal analysis would obviously help give us some causal certainty that was within the original scope of the analysis. But um, then there's a small BHW panel um, in the data set. I was not allowed access for that for reasons that I can discuss uh, in Q&A, if you like, um, but not right now. Uh, and then from this and from this analysis and from review and my other work, my PhD, I'm advocating a, an organizational approach, an organization level approach, um, thinking about work redesign, improving working conditions, um, all the types of work that uh, hopefully we're going to be doing um, in the center here with, um, with Indeed and yeah, thinking through the best ways to make work better for people. Um, so that's the approach that I definitely advocate and it's yeah, good to see that the rest of the center seems to be thinking that too. Uh, oh, and then final bit of analysis, doesn't matter too much. I just looked at some other well-being and job quality drivers on well-being with comparable models as a sort of point of comparison. Um, and yeah, that's me. So some references here, just systematic reviews and um, some critical accounts from sociology to get us thinking about how beneficial these programs would be. So yeah, that's everything. Thanks very much for listening, everybody.